welcome back. Uh, I am Elizabeth. I'm the pastor at First Presbyterian Jacksonville. And our Lent study is going to be a little bit different this year than normal. Normally, we would join together in the sanctuary every Wednesday night. But what we are doing this year is we are going to have um, an online study. And so every Tuesday at noon, I will come on Facebook for the next five weeks. And then I will also email out this video. It's going to be real fast, like five to 10 minutes. And then every Wednesday evening, uh, we are gonna have a really quick, not necessarily really quick, but a Zoom conversation at 6.30 p.m. for everyone who wants to come together. You don't have to do both. If you want to join us for one or the other, perfectly fine. Um, but what we are gonna do is work our way through the book, Embracing a Life of Meaning, uh, with Kathleen Norris and Tim Scorer. And so today, we're going to talk about belief matters. So what I'm going to do is I am going to kind of walk us through the lesson, um, and then we can come together uh, and discuss it on Wednesdays. I'm going to give you a couple things to think about that you can think about and bring back to the conversation, or you can just ponder in your heart, and uh, we can have that time together. So what brings meaning to your life right now. What is belief? Belief, number one, is a lifelong process. We never have this full answer of, here's what I believe, here's belief, and that is the answer, the end for the rest of my life. We will never get to that point, my friends. Um, and it is something that starts from childhood. One thing that Kathleen mentions is that her parents were choir directors in their church. And so for her, her system of belief started when she was four, singing hymns. Um, and th that is something that has just stuck with her. For myself, I come from a family of choir directors and organists and pianists at church. And so I very fully understand that. Um, the idea of hymns, the idea of church music, that is something that informs who I am as well. There are certain things about the Christian faith that uh, she suggests are true. Number one, the Christian faith is counter-cultural. The world will say that what you see is what you get, but the Christian faith says that there is something more. There is something that is holy and sacred about this life. And as we think about what we believe, we need to think deeper than what we see all around us every day. We need to think about the things that are beyond, that lie underneath, that gird up, that shore up the world and everything that we just happen to see. Because everything that we see around us, that is surface, but God is deeper. The next thing, because the world is, because I'm so sorry, faith is countercultural to the world, the world can act to it in a negative way because we go against popular culture. One of the ways that we see this play out is that we so often just see negative stories, see a negative narrative of Christianity, of the Christian faith. This is something that you will see over and over and over again. It happens every day. You open up the newspaper and you see so many negative stories. In reality, we don't see stories of things that are going well, of things that people are doing in a positive manner. And it's because anything that goes against popular culture is seen as threatening. So we need, once again, to look for that which is lying underneath. And we need not feel as though just because it's not popular, it's something that we need to back away from. The third part Sometimes, because it's not popular, sometimes because it is hard, we ourselves resist the countercultural nature of it. God is always present, giving love and grace, and we are asked to respond by doing likewise. We are asked to respond by doing likewise. The best example of this is the Great Commandment, which I sum down real, real fast. Love God, love others, love yourself. That's it. Love God, love others, love yourself. But we reject this in so many ways. One way that we do that is we cling to a bad self-image or we cling to an inflated 
self-image. And both of these go against our identity as children of God. Both of these go against who we were created to be in the imago dei, in the image of God. And when we do that, that means that we cannot admit that we need God. And we play back into that narrative of culture that says that we are part of everything else, that we don't need anyone else, that we are doing just fine all on our own. We hide behind other things. We hide behind money. We hide behind jobs. We hide behind status so that we can deny our need for God. We all do it. We know we do. But the biggest problem, the biggest problem, Kathleen Norris will tell you, is biblical illiteracy and Christian tradition. We have to know the story and be able to tell it. We have to know our story and we have to be able to tell it. And that's when we can get down to figuring out what we believe. So we also have to distinguish between what do we believe and what do we think. Because oftentimes, when I say to somebody, what do you believe? We're going to give you this list of things, and I am as guilty of it as everybody else. If you say to me, Elizabeth, what do you believe? I'm going to say, well, I believe in God. I believe that God made me. I believe that um, God loves me. I believe in Jesus Christ. He came to earth to save me. I believe that the Holy Spirit is with me all the time. But we forget that the root of the word belief is to give your heart to. Belief is not up here. Belief is here. And so here's what I thought when Kathleen said that. My thought was, when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I had to question, what do I treasure? What do I treasure? So what do you treasure? Maybe that's something worth pondering. Part of belief is the need to be able to trust God and to trust one another because belief does not happen in a vacuum. It does not happen all by itself, but we believe in community. We believe together. So how do we believe? As I said before, it's a lifelong process. There are no quick fixes. And part of that community is in worship, it's in prayer. It is in hymns. It is a behavior, and it is a whole body behavior. It is not just the mind part. But there is this act of repetition that goes with it, and we may not fully understand everything we are saying. I think the creeds are a wonderful example of this. If you look at the Nicene Creed, we say, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. What does light from light mean? Heavenly days. We don't necessarily know, but we say it, and frankly, I believe it. Sometimes, with the act of repetition, with saying it all together, we come to believe. We come to believe. In time, things may become meaningful, even though today I cannot give you a definition, but in my heart, I know it's true. There is a power when we say and sing and proclaim as a group. Because in some ways, the creeds are our family story. The Apostles' Creed, that's our family story. The Nicene Creed, that's our family story a little bit later. And every other one that comes after it, that is our story. So we learn the biblical story. We learn the story of our family of faith. And it is still ongoing. So we figure out where our hearts lie. We figure out where we believe. We come together as a group to proclaim what we believe together. And we sit still. We listen to Psalm 46, what says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and look. Look around you. Work against the culture that says what you see is what you get. And look deeper. 
Mary Oliver, the poet laureate, writes this gorgeous poem called Summer Day and talks about a grasshopper, talks to the depth of the way that the grasshopper chews. This grasshopper, I mean the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. How closely do we look at God's good creation? Because that's where we see what God is doing. That's where we see God. We look and we see where God is at work. So, friends, before we close in prayer, I would invite you to join us Wednesday evening at 630. I'm going to send out the Zoom link to the church email list. If you are not on that list and you would like to join us, I welcome you. Please send me an email. My email address is Rev, R-E-V, Elizabeth G, as in girl, at gmail.com, Rev, Elizabeth G, at gmail.com. You can email me or you can give us a private message on our church Facebook page so we have your email address. I hope that you will join us. Some questions for you to ponder, things for you to think about, either on your own or with us as a group. What do you believe? What do you give your heart to? Where does your heart lie? And now a prayer by Tim Scorer. Blessings on this life, birther of meaning. Blessings on these people, companion on the way. Blessings on this day, light of the beloved. Blessings on the past, stories of belief. Blessings on our voices, holy conversation. Blessings on our departure, promise of return. Amen. I hope you have a great day and we will see you next time.